स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया वेलकम बैक टू एन पी टेल द नेशनल प्रोग्राम ऑन टेक्नोलॉजी इनहेंस लर्निंग एंड इनिशिएटिव बाय द इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी एंड द इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ साइंस as you are aware our uh, area or our discipline is cultural studies and we are at the moment in module 4 today we are into the second lecture of module 4 module 4 as i said in the last lecture uh, is devoted to cultural industries uh, cultural forms including new media and cyber culture and uh, towards the end of this module uh, we shall be also doing uh, you know a recap of all the le lectures uh, in which we try to glean the important points the seminal points and the last lecture would be followed uh, uh, sorry the last lecture would be on a critique of cultural studies as a discipline and a methodology well today's lecture is entitled the commodity and i think it uh, rightly follows from our previous lecture that was devoted to culture in that the culture industry and we'll let's uh, as always to a recap of the last lecture in the last lecture um, which was largely uh, the points were largely gleaned from the culture industry enlightenment as mass deception a very important and seminal essay by uh, theodor adorno and max horkheimer in which among other things we find that we find the authors saying that the culture industries uh, particularly mass culture popular culture okay have been in a capitalist setup largely in the service of capitalism where it aids the perpetuation of the capitalist ethos following such you know um uh, in the following the service therefore given by the culture industry to the capitalist system and capitalist ethos there are some important fallouts and these as we found in the last lecture are that ideologies or world views are under such a setup predetermined okay the ideologies that we have the world views that we have tend to be predetermined by the culture industry in uh, in as much as it aids the capitalist system and therefore there is a degree of social control which we may call a manipulation in fact okay of the consumers of mass culture and ultimately the uh, we have an illusion okay we live in a world of illusion where the commodity reigns supreme this also leads to a maintenance of social hierarchy as is already laid out in a capitalist system of social relations then there is a constant to such an order a constant that is manufactured okay by the culture industry and there is more or less an acceptance of the signs and codes okay that are sent out right by the products of culture industries products which we will call or we shall call cultural forms we also read from um barker where uh, we found that you know um one is concerned as he says with the political economy of culture even as one uh, does a study of culture industry right as he says that is with issues of who owns and controls the institutions of economy society and culture and the way in which the corporate ownership and control of the culture industries molds contemporary culture so the essential question in 
uh, when we study culture industries is this ok. Uh, how does a corp capitalist system, how does in particular a corporate ownership and control of culture and cultural industries, how does it mold contemporary culture and what therefore, does it have does it do to us as partakers of such a culture. And then he says in this sense the study of the cultural industries forms a necessary part in cultural studies. He is telling us how why should we study cultural industries in uh, you know in um, cultural within within cultural studies when so many there are the media studies uh, for instance media studies forms a separate uh, domain altogether it is a discipline altogether right. So, in that sense why should we study such uh, you know why should we study mass culture under the, the cultural studies and the answer is that you know it is a matter of political economy who owns and controls the cultural industries that dole out cultural forms and products which have tremendous consequences for contemporary culture. That is why it is important to study cultural industries and aspects like the commodity. The commodity is the topic of discussion today. As always let me therefore, declare the key sources in this lecture, the key source texts in this lecture from which we shall be gleaning the points and from which I, I may also bring out uh, quotations or bring quotations to your notice which I shall then uh, also be uh, explaining okay, or unpacking. So, the texts here are the sage dictionary of cultural studies, the polity reader in cultural theory media and cultural studies and key concepts in cultural theory by Andrew Edgar and Peter Sedgwick. Many of these texts have already been included in other lectures. Uh, the polity reader in cultural theory is, um, is a relatively new text okay, that we are bringing in here. Fine. So, when we study the commodity, we are not only studying the commodity per se. Okay. Along with the commodity there are other terms that also come in which are derivatives from commodity. For instance, com uh, commodification right, is a term uh, which uh, we have to study along with commodity. Commodity fetishism a clearly Marxist term. Okay. So, there are as even as we study the commodity right, we are not going to study the commodity as an economic term. Okay. We are going to study, let me tell you in the beginning, we are going to study the commodity as a cultural term. Okay. A, a commodity uh, uh, also as an important term in political economy. Right. Okay. So, these terms are uh, explained by Barker in the following way. Okay. A commodity simply put is something available to be sold in the marketplace. Okay. So, we all know that uh, commodity is something that we go out and buy, okay, we purchase um, you know in the marketplace and uh, it is uh, a thing does not become a commodity unless and until it is exchanged okay, in the market. Then commodification, commodification according to Barker is the process associated with capitalism by which all spheres of a culture are increasingly put under the sway of the market. So, commodity from the modification from the term commodity, um, we see it as a process which is associated with capitalism. We, uh, we will see more of this when we talk about Marx's analysis of the commodity. Okay. But here he says commodification is a process associated with capitalism by which all spheres of a culture are increasingly put under the sway of the market. Next commodity fetishism is the name Karl Marx gives to the process through which the surface appearance of goods sold in the marketplace obscures the origins of commodities in an exploitative relationship. So, to begin with these are simple definitions which we are uh, you know of commodity, commodification and commodity fetishism. We shall be talking about uh, this in more detail in a while. So, when we uh, you know when we study the commodity right, the first uh, 
uh, person that comes to our mind from the point of view of political economy is of course, Karl Marx. Okay. So, in a study of uh, the commodity definitely these are the terms please look at the slide that we shall have to uh, keep in mind right as uh, we related to the commodity these are false consciousness reification ideology hegemony and commodity fetishism you are by now uh, at least you know uh, if you consider the some of the previous lectures that our discussions okay um, that uh, you know, we have been through these are terms that you are already acquainted with. Okay. So, it is important to keep in mind that the commodity has to be studied under a commodity sorry a uh, political economy framework uh, keeping in mind these uh, other terms fine. So, let us get back to the basics and as I said also in the last lecture to study the basics of the commodity one has to turn to Das Capital. Uh, uh, you know uh, the phenomenal work by Karl Marx and interestingly Marx does not begin his work with you know um, with uh, grandiose theories or grandiose abstractness or formulations right. He begins with what we may call the basic unit okay, the atomic unit so to speak of political economy okay, of the market and that is the commodity right. So, what the molecule perhaps is uh, in a study of biology uh, the commodity is to a study of political economy. Now, Marx says a commodity has uh, you know a thing has two kinds of values. Okay. One is its use value or what we may call its utility. Okay. Every commodity has a utility, everything has a utility. For instance, this um, uh, you know a pen that I am holding you know it has a use value right, its value is that it has a certain utility I am using it right. Uh, a piece, piece of clothing okay, whether it is for exchange or not right has a certain utility or a use value right. On the other hand a commodity also has exchange value that is it can be exchanged say for in a for instance in a barter system uh, I may exchange a piece of clothing for a piece of um, you know a, a food item for instance or in um, a contemporary market scenario uh, things are commodities are exchanged okay, against a common um, against um, a common common could say measuring device uh, say money right. Um, so, if therefore, it follows that a thing may have use value and it at the same time it may not have exchange value right. Uh, Marx gives several examples also from the natural world and also from the world of wo world of our creations. For instance, I may create uh, something, but uh, only with a view to its utility, but not I may not bring it to the market. Okay. So, it is very important for us to understand that a commodity has two aspects the use value and its exchange value. Okay. So, use value is utility and exchange value when it is brought to the market. This is of course, very simply put, uh, but uh, as I said if we have to talk about the commodity we have to begin from Marx. Okay. Now, what happens when the commodity comes to the market? Okay. We are now going into uh, the whole idea of commodity fetishism, okay, where it is said that the social relations of production right, become a relation you know between objects. For instance, when a commodity is produced right, there is a certain amount of labor that is engaged in it apart from the raw materials right, that go into uh, the you know the, that go uh, go as ingredients right into the making of the object or making of a product right. So, what happens 
uh, what happens with the commodity is that the so the social relations of production okay or is, or say the labor process that goes into the production of commodities okay is hidden and appears to us as it says here as it says here in the slide as a relation between objects okay what so what happens is the as it is said the commodity becomes a fetish now fetish is um, is a word that you uh, you are conversant with or word that you are acquainted with sorry um, a fetish is something which you may you know loosely call an obsession something which becomes an obsession right or something that uh, is given uh, uh, an additional value to uh, ad uh, value additional to its what it is used for right so you may have religious fetishes you may have um, uh, objects uh, uh, in religion that have become fetishes, totems for instance, idols for instance, okay. there also may be intellectual products that have become fetishes. Right? Commodity fetishism means when um, the relations of production right, that have been gone into the producing uh, the production of an object. Are and, and and of course in, in uh, you know in, in the Marxist schema the system of exploitation of labor that goes into the production of an object is hidden. Okay, as the commodity begins to have a certain aura about it or a certain fetish about it. We shall see more of this. Here, as beautifully put by Marx, objects become subjects and subjects become objects. So, objects here under the uh, commodity fetishism theory objects become so important right that they replace okay, they replace the social relations of production they replace subjects right and similarly the subjects that is a social relation the people engage in the social relation of production particularly labor they are objectified or rather that is transformed into the object per se or the commodity right therefore what happens is the price of a commodity right which comes about as uh, you know uh, which comes about through complex uh, arrangements of the market okay, which are man made the price of a commodity is an uh, of the price of a commodity now seems as if it is a natural property okay, of that commodity. Why again as we have seen the relations of production and particularly the, the system of exploitation that uh, goes uh, goes uh, you know that goes on in the capitalist system in the sense that private profit or surplus is not shared right is not shared with the worker um, all these are hidden when the commodity is transformed into a fetishized object right so in in such a scenario even the price of the commodity is seen as a natural property as if it is uh, the, you know sort of um, uh, already a uh, given uh, let us put it in another way uh, you know through this um, slide commodity fetishism is therefore, related to the surface appearance of an object. When we uh, you know when we go to the marketplace, when we go to you know to the uh, uh, to the malls, when we look at objects, when we contemplate buying them right. Uh, what are we looking at? We are certainly looking at the surface appearance of the object and you will notice that increasingly right increasingly the object is presented to us it is not just the appearance of the object per se okay. the the surrounding environment of the object is uh, you know adds to making the commodity a fetishized one right highlighting or foregrounding the surface qualities of a commodity. So, the surface let us look at the slide the surface appearance of the commodity masks okay, masks or obscures the exploitative relationships in production right. When you are looking at or contemplating buying the commodity when you are looking at the commodity 
right, uh, on the shelf in the marketplace, you are not uh, looking or uh, the commodity is not narrating to you the story behind uh, its surface appearance. It is not telling you where it has been uh, uh, produced, even if it has a tag okay, saying that made in the, this particular country, you do not have an idea uh, of where it has been, uh, under what circumstances, under what environment has it has been created. For instance, you uh, do not know whether this has been created in a sweatshop you do not know um, you know um, whether the laborers the worker whose labor has gone into the production of this commodity whether he or she has received the minimal wage okay for his or her work you do not even of course contemplate whether that very worker will have access Okay, or can use the very commodity that he or she has helped create. Okay. And uh, in general that is you, have, you, have, you do not the commodity does not tell you, uh, you know what has gone into its production. Right. So, this is the word masks the surface appearance the beautiful surface appearance of the commodity masks or hides or obscures an exploitative relationship between uh, the capitalist owner and the, the, the laborer, okay, the exploitative relationship, the very unequal relationship that exists. Okay. So, when we look at the commodity therefore, in, um, in uh, uh, cultural studies framework, we are to look at it first and foremost under this schema. Then we will uh, now look at a form certain formulations given on, uh, since we talked about the surface appearance, uh, you know the beauty of uh, you know the the commodity the way it you know its its aesthetics help you know helps it to interpolate or to hail out to us that it is something that we need to possess okay we will look now briefly at an essay entitled critique of commodity aesthetics by w f hogg hmm? uh, in this essay Hawke says that when we look at commodity aesthetics or com the beauty of the commodity, what goes into you know the process of aestheticizing um, the commodity, so to speak, so that it find its final product is one that is pleasing to the eye, that is pleasurable to when we use it, etc. Okay, so he says that let's look at this slide here. It's only commodity. The commodity with its aesthetics is only a series of mirrors. Okay, that is forced on to an individual, right? Look at this. This is very important. A series of mirrors forced on to the individual. Why should he use the word mirror? Uh, you are offered, therefore, through the through the commodity, uh, mirrors, right? These are commodities are mirrors, and it is forced on the individual. Why do you look at the you look at the mirror? You look at the mirror to see your own reflection. Okay, so in this case what is happening the commodity in its aestheticized final form okay, is a mirror uh, in which the individual uh, contemplates himself or herself. Okay. So, if you do not possess this beautiful commodity or object, uh, then you, uh, you know the, re the reflection tells you that this is what you will you, you have to possess. Okay. So, according to Hogg, what do we find that in, in the discourse of commodity aesthetics, uh, commodities in its in its un, in, in their uh, in ultimate finished uh, appearance right are really a series of mirrors uh, that an individual is forced to contemplate himself or herself in in a capitalist system what does therefore an individual see there in those mirrors the individual see, sees or contemplates or the commodity seems to be something that uh, uh, something that brings out these qualities okay empathy credibility seduction and attraction right uh, the commodity both em when according to hogg empathizes with you okay empathizes with your desires with your needs and at the same time you also empathize with um, 
the commodity. You know the difference between sympathize and empathize. Empathize is you know uh, more intense in degree in the sense you identify right when you empathize you identify um, you know with a person or a situation. Okay? So, you may also use the word identify here. So, secondly uh, it show you know it also tells uh, you that uh, it has a certain degree of credibility and that is why you have to purchase it or that is why you know you have to own it. Okay? So, if there is identity or empathy, there is credibility as the object speaks uh, to you that it is one which has credibility and therefore needs you need to, to, to possess it. It is also seductive in its beauty, in its appearance, in its aesthetics, in its final form it is also seductive in the sense that you are seduced into procuring the object and of course, there is you know by its in its aestheticized form it is also one that that is extremely attractive. So, Hogg then points out that you know in the mirror so to speak uh, of commodity aesthetics the individual perceives these facts okay, of empathy, credibility, seduction and attraction. So, uh, therefore, again um, as Hogg says in these images people are continually shown the unfulfilled aspects of their existence that we are reading from Hogg's essay. Okay? People are continually shown the unfulfilled aspects of their existence. Again these commodities that show their supposed uh, credibility, their beauty, their attractiveness etcetera uh, only when the mid, such a mirror is held up to the individual. Okay, it only uh, you know um, uh, elicits okay, a sense of unfulfilled aspects. I remember uh, remember uh, you know uh, if I may share this with you, I remember an advertisement uh, when I was in college. Okay, so uh, this advertisement sh uh, showed a uh, a young lady. Okay, smoking a cigarette, and uh, the the advertisement advertisement was of this brand of cigarettes um, called Virginia Slims, and the caption ran thus: "You have come a long way, baby." Okay, so what uh, it was trying to tell the woman is unless and until you smoked that particular brand of uh, cigarettes, which was, uh, you know made only purportedly only for women uh, unless and until you you use that you bought that commodity okay you have not arrived look at this the caption you have come a long way baby so in order to arrive it holds it held up a mirror to you know women uh, you know when we were young that uh, you know uh, if you did not smoke this brand of cigarette you have not arrived or you have not made it such is you know the uh, the great uh, say interpolation or the great seductive capacity okay in that sense that uh, that um, and that advertisement was a mirror saying that you are this says you are unfulfilled or you haven't made it you haven't arrived because you haven't consumed me okay so as you uh, go on with your lives, you'll also see all these, you know, it'll, uh, you know, like, you know, you know, sorry, deliberations like these only help you to, uh, you know, give you this powerful, you know, rather give give you this power to critically look at every interpolating commodity, right? Next time you go to. Uh, I do not mean it in a moral sense, but uh, you know, in next time you go to the mall, you will understand, look at it in a different way, perhaps, and you may study the mall and the way the commodity in its aestheticized form is presented to you. Let us continue to read on from uh, his essay. Commodity aesthetics ideal would be to invent something, okay, something that is not there. Okay, something that well as many would say need not be there. Okay. Commodity aesthetics ideal would be to invent something which enters one's consciousness unlike anything else, something which is talked about which catches the eye and which cannot be forgotten, something which everyone wants and has always wanted. Okay. So, when you uh, the commodity, commodity 
particularly the way it is advertised, okay, particularly the way it is, uh, you know, uh, sort of the way it is aestheticized, okay. Uh, the the ideal, also its goal is to create something which is, as I said, is is not there and needn't be there to create, uh, you know, uh, something that enters into our consciousness and tells us that this is something not only that everyone wants, but interestingly it is something that everyone has always wanted, you follow. So, all aspects of our life okay, are shown to be unfulfilled, aspects of our life are shown uh, you know uh, to be to be kind of um, less successful okay, if we did not go for the commodity. So, cultural studies if you and if you remember uh, some of the previous lectures, uh, one of the very important goals of cultural studies uh, is to study these uh, look at or on uh, you know to explore and show the signs and the codes, the meanings that emanate all these are meanings really okay. uh, you have come a long way baby this is, uh, this is the sign and the, mean, the message that has been given by the particular cigarette company. Okay. So, it uh, um, therefore, cultural studies has always tried to show that there, there are issues of power, okay. there are issues of power and politics of, of economy, um, of economic power, social power of cultural, uh, cultural capital okay, in our cultural practices. The cultural practices are not you know something that only that we do or as complete agents with complete control over us. Okay. Now, the commodity for instance is uh, you know especially in its you know uh, in its highly advertised and marketized form right. The commodity is something that would rule us uh, if we and would define our identities, define our levels of success, uh, define our even uh, you know uh, our reason for being in this world if we are not careful. Okay. So, that is why it is important to, to go through this kind of formulations. Therefore, Barker then says uh, on meanings, we are talking about meanings a while ago, Barker therefore give, has this pronouncement on meanings in commodities. What happens is um, the design, de a lot of uh, you know a lot of research goes into how a commodity is simply not that how a commodity is going to be produced. A lot of uh, you know study, a lot of research okay, goes into how a commodity is going to be designed. Now, design, in, as far as the designing of a commodity is concerned, we may safely say that there are two aspects or there may be two aspects in the design of a commodity. One is its uh, utility, its functionality, its easy you know the uh, its ease of access and use and the other part is its appearance okay, um, the way its aesthetics so to speak. Okay. So, design and production uh, of you know objects or commodities always go through a process of modification as it is shown here in this slide okay. and in, in this process of modifying okay, rapidly okay, if you look at the contemporary uh, you know um, contemporary construction of meaning okay, and the rapid change changes these go through, you will understand that these are backed by rapid ma modifications in design and production of commodities. So, if you look at this slide here, the design modification and design and uh, production of commodities uh, leads to new meanings through representation. Okay. Uh, the, the, if you look at the way commodities are have been sold in the past or the way commodities have been marketed and advertised in the past, you will see it has advertisements today have come a very long way. Okay. They have changed there is so, so much of study going on even cognitive uh, psychological studies of uh, consumers, pro consumer profiles um, you know and how what would be pleasing to a com uh, uh, consumer so much of research has uh, go uh, research goes into it. So, this kind of modification okay, of the object both from point of view of design and production create new meanings through these new representations. Okay. Then these advertisements right with their newer meanings why newer meanings newer because they keep changing all the time 
constitute again new identities, right. They give new identities uh, because as I said their representation representations uh, keep changing because of modifications of design in a bid uh, you know to get more and more people to buy those commodities. These advertisements are also give new meanings and constitute new identities. So, this really keeps continuing in a chain ok. There are changes in, in design production there is therefore, creation of new meanings right and with the creation of new meanings again there are creations of new identities and once these new identities and meanings are saturated then again becomes a whole circle okay, of modification of new representations of uh, new meanings and new identities. So, it goes on at infinitum. Then what happens is it is not just a one way traffic okay, as Barker says it is not a one way traffic in the sense that uh, the identities that have been created Okay, at the level of changes in design and production, the ident new identities that have been created and consumed and adhered to or accepted by people, these in turn, okay, uh, they affect the level of consumption. Okay. For instance, if a new identity created by, uh, um, you know, created as a result of new changes in development, uh, sorry, in design and production when there is a new identity that is created which is useful or which is accepted by people which of course, creates almost a fad and a kind of a fashion rage for instance in people. What happens if you look at this slide here? It affects right the level of consumption. If it is not uh, something that is accepted by people that too okay, affects the level of consumption. And then the level of consumption would again feed back into the design and production. So, much so they shape the production of a uh, design and production of that good. Okay. So, as I said it is a whole circuit or it is a whole uh, you know it is a very circuitous um, in a circuitous manner okay, design and production being modified create new representations, new meanings and new identities, new identities are taken or not taken up by people that in turn okay, uh, affects the level of you know consumption which in turn feed back into the original design and production uh, and which make uh, you know which make new changes okay, new changes are made and the design and production further go on are modified to create further meanings and further identities. So, this again is a uh, you know uh, a circle really uh, which uh, which uh, as in which the commodity is uh, captured and encapsulated okay therefore coming back to the previous point on capitalism what happens is uh, you know in a broader sense if we look at it from a broader perspective something very interesting that goes on and something very um, seminal for us okay in such a scenario that we have described all this while, things are commodified. Remember we said that there are three major terms commodity, commodification and commodity fetishism. So, we have looked at the commodity, its use value, its exchange value, we have looked um, uh, in quite detail about commodity fetishism. Uh, there, there is this last word that is that remains that is commodification. So, what happens is in this system objects, people, qualities, values, okay, signs, meanings everything becomes commodified. So, there is a commodification right, there is a commodification not only of objects, but also of people, of qualities, even of values and signs and their meanings everything uh, becomes commodified. So, that we live so to speak in a sphere of commodity and commodification okay, such is the power of um, uh, power of the commodity. Now, we will quickly we will end by quickly uh, looking at uh, one or two formulations by you know different critics and first let us take up Adorno since we are acquainted with him through our last lecture. Adorno uh, says that when commodities are standardized, when commodities are used in mass culture, what happens is it leads to uh, authoritarianism and conformism. 
right. So, authoritarianism is the obviously the authority that is uh, used an authority uh, uh, that is given rather given by the whole process by this whole circuit okay, to the producer to the capitalists and on the other hand there is a certain conformism of the masses the conformism of the people who consume. Okay, we have done a bit of this in the last lecture nevertheless I quickly repeated there is a conformism there is a standardization to which people conform as far as mass culture pro, uh, products are concerned. Okay. So, according to Adorno this, this is an aspect that we need to keep in mind. Also as some critics have uh, um, like particularly like Richard Hogarth for instance have pointed out many, many propose that working class culture okay, uh, people or people belonging to working the working class. Uh, people who have culture who know who, uh, cultural practices within working class culture which are not really into uh, mass culture or not uh, you know also into also into high culture okay some would propose there is a certain degree of authenticity in working class culture okay and uh, whereas in commodity culture because of the surface the the, the surfaceness of you know of appearance of aesthetics etcetera uh, is a shallow one. Okay. So, this is an important and uh, many Marxist critics early Marxist critics particularly cultural critics had pointed to this um, that basically working class culture because it is out of the circuit okay, is, is an authentic culture it is rooted in labor uh, it is perhaps closer to nature and it is more authentic and it is more dignified for the human species whereas, a culture that is uh, you know uh, steeped in, in in the market steeped in in the whole uh, culture on the cultural practices of uh, the commodity is a one which is a shallow one. For instance, Barker says here thus let us read from him thus one of the central criticisms of the commodification of culture is that it not only shapes and disciplines cultural meanings but also this is important also turns people into commodities. Okay. This, is an, uh, this, is, this is a very uh, this is a very strong point being made by Barker. Okay. Well, let us read it again once one of the central criticisms of the commodification of culture is that it not only shapes and disciplines cultural meanings uh, in the sense that well even if it shaped and disciplined cultural meanings uh, maybe till then it is not so we could say it is not so harmful if I may use the word, but the fact that it also turns people into commodities is one which would tie in with this whole understanding of commodity culture as a shallow one. Okay. Now, the example given here is this for example, the promotion of the slender body as a disciplinary cultural norm for women centers on diet as a commodity as well as self monitoring. Now, he is using the you know um, uh, all uh, uh, these you know the, 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 the diet industry for instance uh, related to the health and beauty industry okay, which shows um, projects the slender female body as the as uh, the most desired body okay, this, uh, is, is as the most ideal form that um, all female bodies should aspire to and hence use the commodities that are being given to us by uh, the diet and the beauty industry. Okay. He says that uh, Barker says that it is a disciplinary cultural norm that it is a regulated cultural norm for women and it centers on diet as a commodity as well as self monitoring. However, paradoxically commodity culture offers us images of desirable foods while proposing that we eat low calorie items. This is the paradox. Okay. On, on the other hand you have uh, you know food aesthetics right we have um, uh, food aesthetics. We, remember we did uh, we had had this lecture on uh, on consumption and uh, where we talked about eating out and where we uh, where we said that um, our identities are related to you know to food, food and cultural studies uh, form a very important food forms a very important area of cultural studies and how uh, desires 
uh, how palettes are even constructed okay and identities are also woven into this in the same way here okay whereas you know the uh, the, the whereas the, the slender body is shown to be the norm on the other hand you also have food industries as he says here uh, offering us desirable images or uh, images of desirable foods while proposing that we eat low calorie items and buy exercise equipment right in the face of this contradiction as Barker says the capacity for self control and the containment of fat is posed in moral as well as in physical terms. Okay. So, I think Barker is adding another dimension here is that we in our study of the commodity and the cultural studies we are uh, you know we may begin with uh, the most elementary uh, sorry most uh, 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 yeah, uh, the, the most elementary you begin with the commodity as the most elementary unit as an atomic unit okay, of political economy of production distribution and consumption. Uh, that is definitely something we need to look at because it is a basic formulation without which we cannot have these sophisticated formulations. But Barker is pointing to something else here and he is saying you know even if, if as we study it we also have to understand that all uh, you know commodities sometimes are uh, or, or the commodity industries are at times you know. Uh, at times so also at, at, at loggerheads in the sense that while the beauty industry and the diet industry uh, gives you um, you know uh, the ideal of the beautiful slender body on the other hand the food industry with uh, you know um, with its desirable foods okay, um, is at odds with the diet industry. On the other hand uh, even as it shows us that we are supposed to consume it, we also have coming along with it okay, um, exercise equipment, uh, 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 you know um, low, low calorie food industries okay, and all these things uh, together uh, give you know almost one is faced with a moral dilemma. So, the uh, you know the uh, capacity for self control. Okay, the identifying of a person even in moral terms and you know it, it is couched in moral terms. Okay, this is something that we also I think um, discussed in one of um, uh, our lectures uh, when you talk about the body, okay, when you talked about the, the body and the ideal body how you know health issues are also moral issues as it is shown by the health industry. Right? And we will end with uh, Habermas, Habermas says um, uh, rational citizens become non rational consumers non rational consumers why because we give in to the seduction and the empathy and uh, the attraction of these commodities. Baudrillard also says uh, very significantly that the so called use value and exchange values proposed by Mar Marx today in fact become sign values commodities have also sign values apart because they have meanings okay there's some meanings and identities created by them they, they apart from uh, the use value which and exchange value we should also add this other element which is as he calls the sign value of me or meaning creating value of the commodity so commodity in that sense may also be called commodity signs so we uh, let's move on to the discussion where we have a couple of questions. For instance, what are the two kinds of values in a commodity? Uh, this is clearly a question for Marx and we have to then say that if it is a two mark question you simply say that the commodity uh, uh, called, uh, as given to us by Marx, uh, the understanding as given by Marx has two kinds of values, one is its use value and one is, is exchange value and if you get a 5 mark or, or question then you have to explain use value and exchange value and how uh, you know a thing is not necessary that the thing is also a commodity, a thing becomes a commodity when it has exchange value. Okay. Otherwise a thing has a use value and uh, things may have use value without becoming commodities if it is not you know in a system of exchange and then it does not have exchange value. right? Then what is commodity fetishism a very important point not only in Marxist theory, but also generally in cultural studies is commodity fetishism is when a commodity becomes a fetish or an obsession. 
right. It is not that it, it, it becomes something that we have to buy, it is an obsession for us without which we cannot live. The meaning is that when the surface appearance of a commodity okay, hides or masks the system of relationship that underlies the production process of that commodity, okay. but in particular it hides the exploitative uh, relationship in uh, the social relation of production, okay, where the commodity uh, is shown you know, in its final form, fi final aestheticized form to the public. Okay and where it, it has no markers, it has no signs of what has gone into the production. It has no signs as to where it has been, usually it has no signs of where it has been produced, under what labor conditions it has been produced, what were the wages paid to the laborers. Okay. Perhaps if those signs and markers were there, indications were there, one in a moral sense would think twice before consuming, but that object, but in, in, uh, in a uh, system of capitalism the commodity is shown to be something that we have to possess, where, uh, where our identities are engaged, where meanings are engaged, okay, where as um, uh, we find found in one of the essays here, where it is in, in fact a mirror, right, which is which is in which you should find yourself reflected and if you do not find yourself reflected in that mirror, you are supposed as I said to be leading an unfulfilled okay, existence or even an unsuccessful existence. So, in, in the commodity fetishism framework therefore, objects or the commodities become subjects, right? instead of people and their social and economic relationships being most important, it is the object which takes place of people. And the subjects, therefore, people also become commodities. This is so beautifully put by Marx, okay, where objects become subjects and subjects become objects. People become objects and the objects uh, become more important than people. Finally, what is commodity aesthetics? And we uh, say that commodity aesthetics, according to Hogg, um, or commo first commodity aesthetics is uh, would be. Um, an area of study and research uh, where you know uh, where um, research researchers would try and you know enhance okay the aesthetic aspects of a commodity other than its utility but uh, hogg here gives us a critique of and tries to show us what uh, actually goes behind uh, commodity aesthetics and he calls it a series of mirrors which has ha has been forced upon an individual in the name of creating empathy, credibility in commodities, which are act, uh, and a certain act, attractiveness, which actually are a seductive device, okay, so that we may use and buy and use these commodities. So, how does Baudrillard conceptualize a commodity? Baudrillard says that apart from use value and exchange value, today with the increasing uh, aestheticization and the surface meanings, okay, the increasing importance in the surface meanings of commodities, what we have to do is we also have to say that there is another, you know, um, uh, there is another value and which is the sign value or the symbolic meanings that adhere or that sort of uh, surround okay, a commodity uh, because commodities are fetishized. Okay. Well, I hope uh, then this lecture on the commodity as a cultural form and a commodity as the basic unit of cultural industries. I hope this lecture has been important for, for you. Definitely, this is not all. This is certainly not all that we can say about commodity, but at least I hope by you know by introducing this topic to you and talking about things like the Marxist conception of use value and um, uh, and exchange value of commodity fetishism of you know the um, the way we can critique commodity aesthetics and we the way we can see the interpolation how it uh, you know how in the capitalist system uh, commodities are you know not given to us only in the utilitarian forms, but also in the highly aestheticized, highly advertised forms. I hope these are, uh, this has been useful to you and um, we shall uh, remain with culture industries and cultural forms and when we talk about in the next few lectures on media, on television, on new media, on you know virtual uh, and cyber culture etcetera. Okay. So, thank you for now. <laughs>